Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. So Ukraine War News Update. The uh, third part there on for the 25th of November 2024. I just want to dip into an idea I was talking about in the last military air video and indeed yesterday. This idea that the US provides all this kind of boring stuff like the ammunition at, at scale, uh, you know, 105, 155mm artillery shells, um, high Mars missiles and all this all this stuff that is consistently provided for Ukraine so they can uh, keep prosecuting this defensive war against the US. Yeah, it's nice when they get Bradley's uh, infantry fighting vehicles. Yes, it's nice when they get tanks. Yes, it's nice when they get F-16s, but if they don't get this boring stuff on a consistent basis, then they will be in serious trouble. We saw what happened in a seven-month hiatus when the uh, appropriations bill failed to get through Congress. Now, Shashank Joshi talks about this piece in the Financial Times by Stringer. Uh, is it Edward Stringer, who is a uh, retired Air Force chap from the RAF chap from the UK, uh, very high up commander. Um, it's a it's boring war stuff like ammunition stockpiles, transport and logistics that really matters, says Stringer, who has written about a possible post US NATO. Quote, it's also what almost nobody does properly at scale except for the US. It's exactly my point. That's what I'm I'm most worried about sanctions being lifted, but I'm also worried about the kind of the bread and butter of warfare, the ammunition that will will be stopped, I think, after January the 20th. Uh, Shashank Joshi from The Economist says of this article, this is interesting, quote, in extremists such as the need to give Ukraine whatever it needs, it's fine to buy from outside the EU, says one French official. I talked about that previously in the last video that French are now becoming a little bit more open to that. Uh, quote, fully replacing the US military contribution is equivalent to about 0.3% of the EU GDP. UK and Europe can afford that, the European defence official says, although, quote, it will be a particularly difficult decision because much would have to be bought from the Americans. Uh, so there you go. That's in the Financial Times. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of what, well, exactly what I was saying with the added uh, conclusion that if, if the EU and Europe as a whole is going to replace what the US is doing, then they need to ramp up the scale of production inside Europe, but also might well need to be buying an awful lot from the US. And uh, that would mean opening the purse strings even wider. Right, we're going to go, we're going to start with Tbilisi in Georgia, where protests continue and a modest amount of people are spending the night in front of the parliament. Despite this and the refusal of the opposition parties to have mandates, the Georgian Dream Party announced that the first session of the parliament will be held so it's kind of interesting to see where that is going to go i hope that the uh that the georgians are able to protest this uh, but it is uh, it's going to be challenging um tomorrow that is when the parliament opens meanwhile the security forces are calling for quote not to cross the boundaries of the law otherwise the police threaten to take measures um so that is simmering there in georgia now let's go to another country that could well be under the influence of Russia in elections. Now, there's panic in Romania, says GNQ. Today, or that's yesterday, as a pro-Russian candidate that no one's ever heard of, with no visible means of funding, wins the first round of presidential elections after only registering on October the 1st. Romanians and Romanian media are considering it a Russian attack. Um... OK, so in Romania, the independent right wing candidate Kalin Georgescu is leading in the first round of the presidential elections. He has criticised military aid to Ukraine and opposed EU policies. The second round is scheduled for December the 8th. Uh, this is being reported widely. So the Financial Times is that same pro-Russia hard right candidate tops a Romanian presidential poll. First round victory for Kalin Georgescu shakes the political establishment. So Max24 says, or well, quote from the... Um, or taken from the FT, says uh, Georgescu has secured 23% of the vote according to early results. Leftist Prime Minister Marcel Kiolaku has, don't know if that's pronounced correctly, has secured 19% with Liberal leader Lasconi lagging him by just 3,000 votes. What will happen in the second round? 
Uh, Ukraine aid cricket takes that surprise lead. Um, here, the Kiev Independent reports on it. Georgescu is leading the polls with 22.92% and roughly 99.9% .9 of vote counted. Uh, following the centre-left Prime Minister at 19.17 and Lasconi, as mentioned, at 19.16. Now, if, you, if those two could get together and one drop out, then, hey, you got, you got chances. Now, this source was saying something colossally fishy about the Romanian president's uh, the Romanian presidential elections first round held yesterday. Uh, Kalin Georgescu barely discussed as a candidate and barely mentioned in opinion polling. Somewhere came top, somehow came top with 22% of the vote. And needless to say, he's a Putin dude and on the far right. So you have this, uh, that's that purple line there, which only kind of starts um, somewhere around here. I'm trying to work out where it starts. It looks like it might be there and then goes up really dramatically now is this some dodginess from the russians it could well be but it could also be this which is also far that sorry incredibly likely to be due to russian influence so either way i think there's rough russian influence here so someone else says in the last three days he exploded on tiktok uh, lots of people believed he is a moderate nationalist, pro-farming, pro-EU, and voted for him without checking. Most people of the PNL or PSD uh, fans disappointed in their own parties. Lots of people learned today about who he actually is. So you might get a bit of a, a, a day of reckoning in the second uh, day of in the second round of elections, whereby people are like, "Oh, I voted for him, but I didn't really know who he was. I just thought he was an upstart." Turns out he's a pro-Russian person that that you know, my opinion might have been pe meddled with, might have been influenced by TikTok and and some Russian influence there. I'm actually going to go back to um, or either another uh, third party candidate or well, I don't know. So I I don't know the rules here. What they do in terms of who they take? Do they take the top two? Do they take the top three? Um, and that's why those three people are mentioned. Um, will the left vote get split if you've got two left wing candidates in the final three? I don't know. But it could be that it sorts itself out in the second round. This is definitely a concern because if something like that got in, uh, Romania are a hugely important uh, component of European support for Ukraine and NATO support. So they're a Na they are a NATO nation, and there are this is where the F sixteen pilots are getting trained. Right, Romania needs to be a, needs to remain a stalwart supporter of Ukraine. It's kind of like Bulgaria in the region. It's, it's super super important. So that has to go right going forward. Now, Polish farmers who staged a protest in the village of Medica have, and uh, who had blocked the Shigini border crossing with Ukraine have suspended their blockade. So that's good news. Um, despite low poll numbers after the coalition collapse, the SPD has unanimously nominated Olaf Scholz as their chancellor candidate ahead of Boris. Well, Boris Pistorius pulled out. Um, now, Gabrielius Landsbergis, the former Lithuanian foreign minister, says tragically one crew member is dead and others hospitalised after a DHL cargo aircraft crashed on approach to Vilnius Airport. As I reported this morning, my condolences to the victims' families. The investigation is ongoing and nothing has been ruled out. There could be any number of things happening. DHL planes have had parcels. A couple of instances of supposed Russian exploding parcels put on board. One, um, I, and they're both going, I think, from Germany, Leipzig Airport, Leipzig. Um, here, this came from Leipzig as well to Vilnius. It could be Russian interference. It might not be. Um, but uh, hopefully the investigations do come up with a definite answer and not some kind of vague unknown where we're just kept guessing because that's exactly what Russia would want to let get themselves off the hook there. Anton Gerashenko says of South Korea and the relationship between them and Russia, Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia Andrei Rudenko called on South Korea to soberly assess the a situation and refrain from reckless steps. And I love this. I said this yesterday. It's completely inverted. Like the idea that Russia can lecture South Korea on reckless steps. You better not go and help Ukraine. South Korea should be going, hang on, Russia. What about your reckless steps of getting to 11,000 North Korean soldiers and expanding a, a factory manufacturing missiles in North Korea and getting 9 million North Korean uh, artillery rounds and countless missiles and MLRS and self-propelled guns. Like, who's being reckless here? Because it ain't South Korea. 
This is that, that kind of projection that Russia is so good at doing. Quote from the Russian deputy foreign minister. Seoul must realise that the possible use of South Korean weapons to kill Russian citizens will destroy, fully destroy relations between our countries. Of course, we will respond in every way that we find necessary. It is unlikely that this will strengthen the security of the Republic of Korea itself. Ow, this is a real threat. I hope that the administration of the Republic of Korea will be guided primarily by long-term national interests and not by short-term opportunistic considerations prompted from the outside, he added. In my opinion, says Gerashenko, long-term national interests of South Korea will benefit from military aid to Ukraine and helping us defeat Russia. Do you get a pattern that's happening at the moment? Russia is just getting involved freaking everywhere, putting their ore in everywhere, and they are succeeding. I think the US is compromised now by Russian influence, and we'll go on to look at that in a second. And they are the biggest supporter of Ukraine. It is. It breaks my heart. Uh, I, just European nations are being um, compromised by Russia. Their influence operations are incredibly successful. Now, Britain has imposed sanctions on 30 ships from Russia's shadow fleet. This marks the UK's largest sanctions package of its kind, targeting vessels that moved over $4.3 billion in oil and petroleum products this last year. Uh, so that's a largest sanction, uh, sanctions um, suite on the Russian shadow fleet. And I hope that that has an effect. Sanctions also include Russian insurance firms, Alpha Strakovani and VSK. So the UK doing its bit there, good stuff. Right, let's move on to the US, where we seem to spend an awful lot of time at the moment as the elections are still, the effects of the elections are still being felt and being sorted out. Okay, uh, this is Pat McFadden. Uh, before we get to some of the, um, the appointments, this is Pat McFadden, the UK Cabinet Office Minister, though. This is concerning cybersecurity in NATO, so that kind of affects the US to some degree. No one should underestimate the Russian cyber threat to NATO. Um, he emphasised that Russia is exceptionally aggressive and reckless in the cyber realm. If Moscow launches a wave of cyber attacks against NATO members, millions of people could find themselves without electricity. This will be discussed at the NATO Cybersecurity Conference in London today, Politico reports. The Russian threat to NATO countries is finally being taken seriously. Hopefully strong uh, decisions will follow. I, it, it depresses me again that so many people in America just don't see Russia as a threat that somehow the threat is America itself, the enemy within, or Zelensky and Ukraine. It is so, so depressing. I was gonna leave this till last, but actually this is probably a good time to talk about this. So, you know, we had Joe Rogan give his opinion uh, about Ukraine and Zelensky, and that was egregious in my opinion. And then we had uh, Vladimir Klitschko, so actually not the mayor of Kiev, but his brother, heavyweight boxer, um, Klitschko, one of the greatest heavyweight boxing champions of all time, total career earnings, earnings of $250 million, could live anywhere in the world but chooses to grab a rifle and join defence of Kiev. So at the beginning of the war, uh, he um, went to join the territorial defence, I think. Uh, I don't know what has happened with him since the beginning of the war. But anyway, Candace Owens, who is a, who is a right-wing influencer, a uh, black woman who is accused often of saying things that are really pro-white and therefore seeming really con controversial, the kind of Uncle Sam approach. She listens to what Klitschko said in like, I challenge you, I mean, you're wrong. Can I come on your podcast to talk to you about how you're wrong? I think exactly what was needed. So how do we go about correcting these misconceptions? Let's let's sit down and have a conversation about it. Candace Owens, so a real representative of that right wing ecosystem in the US information spaces, says fake and gay lol. Like as if she's a twelve year old. As if she's at school. Like that, that's that's really mature. Lol, fake and gay. What what are you who are you, what are you? Ah. Oh. So Klitschko, who is living in a city that is under threat of missile and drone attack every single night saying i'll come over and explain to you what we're going through what the reality on the ground is like and you've got candace owen saying this st stupid stuff uh just it's so 
so depressing. And that that's what I mean is is that the Russian narrative has has gained purchase in so many people's heads. I've been having arguments on Facebook with someone who's just sunk is has really drunk the Russian Kool Aid, and it's so depressing, as I keep saying. Now. And Apple Balm here, who is fighting the good fight in the information spaces, saying censorship will begin in the name of anti-censorship. What's she talking about? Uh, Trump has vowed to crack down on universities involved in misinformation research, or what he dubs the censorship cartel, e.g. by curbing funds to those who have flagged content for removal or legal threats. I'm pretty effing scared, one professor tells me. And this is another piece in the Financial Times. Donald Trump's return sends shivers through the anti-misinformation world. Like, this is one of my raisons d'etre, okay? This is why I'm here. This is why I do what I do, because I'm scared, really scared of disinformation and the effect it can have on people. We are fighting this fight, you and I, all day, every day. Well, I am. This is, this is what I do. And I think we're losing a battle at the moment because of this compromise. And you've got this freaking man. And I'm sorry, I know some of you are still thinking, yeah, Trump's great and whatever. But if you are allowing, you know, you've got Elon Musk, who I was just finishing the book um, Character Limit about his taking over of, uh, of Twitter and how he changed the coding to amplify his own voice and... You know, we all know about the amplification and the coding that has like Ukrainian news has treated the same as disinformation. And it's just every element that, that we learn about is to the to Putin's advantage. He is the most successful, I think, stirrer in the world, Putin, possibly ever. He's having incredible success in compromising people like Musk and and Trump here, if Trump is going to go through uh, putting things in place that is going to make uh, ferreting out disinformation and misinformation even harder, then our jobs are, are, are suddenly more difficult. This is so freaking depressing again. I'm sorry to just be a harbinger of bad news. It's fascinating, you know, when you look at, to talk about M M Trump, uh, Musk, it's really interesting. I mean, his dad, I have no time for his dad but, at all. Um, he's a wingnut, but he's on this video interview in South Africa talking about how Elon Musk's mum, mum's side, so mum's parents were escaped from Canada as they're part of the pro-Nazi German party in Canada. This is obviously going back to, to the war period and escaped to, to apartheid South Africa because they really appreciated apartheid. You're like, oh, now I'm starting to understand Elon Musk a little bit here. Right, I get it. Yeah, and actually, you listen to his mum now. His mum's an absolute wingnut. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, you put put all these pieces of jigsaw together, and it's like, oh, so depressing. Now, Trump's top security pick calls for the end to escalation in Ukraine, as if this is kind of Ukraine's fault, right, or or Biden's fault, uh, possibly. So this is Mike Waltz. I, I guess you could interpret this several ways we need to restore deterrence restore peace and get ahead of this escalation ladder rather than responding to it so you could read that as in being critical of the present situation and wanting to go for kind of appeasement or you could read this in a, in a pretty good way which is uh, if we flex as the us we being the us if, if we flex says uh, mike waltz then Russia will kowtow uh, to the deterrence of our flexing and they'll be deterred from acting. And we put an end to this escalation by just going, right, and Russia will go, oh, sorry about that. And that's how we, that's how we get peace. Uh, does that then lead to appeasement? Right, okay, there's no escalation. That stopped. Right, we're going to force peace on you. So I don't know, you know, it can be read in a number of different ways that. Now, two people who are in very important positions of influence in Trump's larger team 
are, and I've referred to both these guys before, Keith Kellogg and Fred Flights, because they put together the peace plan for Ukraine, an option for Trump to take. And it was Trump seems to be talking this kind of peace plan up. Um, anyway, reading a recent book chapter by Trump adjacents, Keith Kellogg and Fred Flight, says Shashank Joshi, a really vitriolic and extreme tone towards Biden, quote, it was in America's best interest to maintain peace with Putin and not provoke and alienate him with aggressive globalist human rights and pro-democracy campaigns. You know, as if, if that's bad. Um, so, uh, yeah. The Biden admits a quote from the book. The Biden administration's approach to national security rejected Trump's transactional approach to Russia, under which Trump established a working relationship with the U.S. adversary. Biden replaced the Trump approach with a li liberal internationalist one that promoted Western values, human rights and democracy. How terrible. Uh, contrary to the Trump administration's America first stance on the national security, uh, the Biden approach put in the idealistic agendas of the global elite ahead of a working relationship with Russia. Uh, Biden was not so not interested in working with Putin. He wanted to lecture and isolate him. Biden's hostile policy toward Russia not only needlessly made it an enemy of the US, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so that's where they're going. These are the people, by the way, who are going to be, I think, very influential within the Trump administration concerning the approach to the Ukraine conflict. Uh, Kellogg and Flights falsely argue that the US offer to delay Ukrainian admission into NATO by 10 years, quote, might have been enough in early 2022. This was publicly mooted and explicitly rejected by Russia at the time um, by Rodikov and then Putin himself, e.g. there you go. That's in TASS news report. So again, they're, they're playing loose, fast and loose with, with facts. Kellogg and Fleiss do say that the Russian invasion was heinous and that originally it was in America's interest to ensure that Russia lost the war. But they also describe US aid as a proxy war with goals of weakening the Putin regime at home and destroying its military. No evidence is provided, though, for these claims. On a deal, Kellogg and Fleiss say, quote, the US would continue to arm Ukraine and strengthen its defense to, defenses to ensure Russia will make no further advances and will not attack again, end quote, encouraging, but they don't address what this might require in money and munitions or what happens if peace talks fail. Um, on the substance of a deal, Kellogg and Fleiss say that Ukraine wouldn't be asked to cede territory formally and sanctions would remain until Russia signal a final settlement acceptable to Ukraine. They also propose levies on Russian energy sales to pay for Ukrainian reconstruction. All pretty interesting. So that's looking slightly better and that's a step away from what we're hearing from, say, J.D. Vance and others in the administration. So there could be elements of the Fleiss-Kellogg approach if it's taken on by by a trump that could be i mean at the end of the day and i said this previously when their original peace plan came out which is these guys aren't like total russian appeasers but i disagree with some of the ways that they would go about doing the their peace plan and, and they're the ones that like okay if you if you don't come to the the table if Russia don't come to the table, we'll arm Ukraine even more. And if Ukraine don't come to the table, we will no longer give any assistance to Ukraine. So it's kind of forcing them both to the table. But of course, the timing for that will be beneficial for Russia. Um, as someone says below, this is pure MAGA double thinking action. On one side, Putin is a poor victim of libtard human right globalist ideology. At the same time, Putin is a thug, which is imperative. Uh, and it's imperative he doesn't prevail in Ukraine and kept at bay with maximum pressure if possible. And that's right. It is doublespeak. It's like they want to still own the libs by Biden being wrong X, Y, Z. But Russia is still at uh, Russia is still the bad guys, kind of. It's like the US are the bad guys and Russia are the bad guys. And that's that kind of doublespeak element uh, to which I tend to agree. I think that's quite common uh, to see. Okay. And now moving on, we're going to do a little bit more time on Tulsi Gabbard. Sorry to keep going on about her, but it is super important. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard's history with Russia is even more concerning than you think. Uh, it's all, in almost every foreign conflict in which Russia had a hand, Gabbard backed Moscow and railed against the US. This is a really long and interesting article. It's a good article in The Independent. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard's history with Russia is even more concerning than you think. Now, our expert says her views are, quote, so wildly fringe that her potential appointment as Director of National Intelligence is genuinely alarming. So it's Richard Hall and Andrew Feinberg, right? Now, we're going to join this somewhat down. So it, it talks about her relationship with Assad and Syria and et cetera, et cetera. And the, these different views that are 
completely antithetical to national security of, of uh, America, by the way. And it's all very interesting. You should read it all. It's, it's a long article, this. And we're going to join the article down here, and I'm going to read the rest of it. So, you know, strap yourselves in. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Gabbard again defended Russian aggression. Quote, this war and suffering could have easily been avoided if Biden, admin and NATO had simply acknowledged Russia's legitimate security concerns. So Re Russia's legitimate security concerns. That's what she posted in 2022 at the outbreak of the war. And that's who would be in charge of national intelligence. Someone who clearly thinks that Russia has legitimate security concerns. Gabbard appeared to fall for various conspiracy theories about the conflict that were promoted by Russia, as she had done in Syria. One of the, and it's, the article's already looked into that. One of those conspiracy theories was a Russian claim about the existence of dozens of US-funded biolabs in Ukraine that were supposedly produced deadly pathogens. Uh, she later walked back on walked back on those remarks suggesting there might have been some miscommunication and misunderstanding of course gabbard's frequent echoing of the kremlin talking points has earned her the praise of russian state media indeed an article published on the 15th of november in the russian state controlled outlet ria novosti went so far to call gabbard a quote superwoman the possibility that Trump would tap someone with Gabbard's history to be America's top intelligence official shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who followed the president-elect's first four years in the White House. During his 2018 summit with President Vladimir Putin in Helsinki, and this is me speaking now, this is his worst moment in international politics, I think. Uh, um, the then-president was asked if he believed the US intelligence community's assessment, which stated that Russia had interfered in the 2016 presidential election on his behalf. That assessment was based on analysis of what was determined to have been state-sponsored campaigns of fake social media posts and ersatz news sites to spread false stories about his Democratic opponent, Hillary Clinton, as well as cyber attacks targeting the Democratic National Committee and prominent operatives associated with the Clinton campaign. This is stuff, me again, this is stuff that we've seen ever since. We've been talking about it in the last two years, that that's exactly what Russia does with their doppelganger approach to um, to information warfare, etc., etc. But Trump, it continues, who just spent several hours in a closed door meeting with Putin. Remember, there was no one else but the, the translator there, so no one knew what happened in that meeting. No one knows it. Stunned the assembled press and the entire world by declaring that he trusted the Russian leader's word over that of his own advisors, as in his own intelligence community. Quote. This is from Trump. President Putin says it's not Russia. I don't see any reason why it would be. Trump would go on to repeatedly clash with his own intelligence appointees during the remainder of his term. By the way, the GOP at the time actually went nuts about that. And Trump had to kind of walk it back. He didn't fully walk it back, but he walked it back a little bit because his own party went nuts. I wonder whether his party would do the same these days. It's a different time now, 2024, than that was 2018. He sacked his first DNI, former Indiana Senator Dan Coates, after Coates repeatedly declined to back away from the government's assessment of what Russia was, had done during the 2016 presidential race. So you've got a guy, your intelligence advisor, that said, right, we've done the intelligence, here's the actual data. And by the way, and this is me speaking now, like Facebook and Twitter had come out and admitted that this had happened and they had their own data. Right. So you got you got this backed up by the social media companies. He comes out and says, look, there was interference. And rather than deal with that, Trump just sacks him. Like, you're not saying what I want you to say. You need to say what I want you to say. Yeah. But but this is reality here. Like, I've, like we've done. The, have you done the research, Trump? Have you actually gone and analysed all this stuff? Because we've done that. We've got experts whose job is to do this. Here's a report. Russia meddled. Yeah, but. That's not what I want to hear. So therefore, I'm going to sack you. Because when I hear things I don't want to hear, I get rid of the messenger. And then it doesn't exist. La 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 la. Larry Pfeiffer, the director of George Mason University's Hayden Center for Intelligence Policy and International Security, said Gabbard's apparent susceptibility to foreign disinformation and her affinity for strongmen will give pause to American allies with whom the US routinely shares intelligence on common threats. Intelligence services, he explained, are notoriously territorial and tight-lipped on sources and methods, particularly when it comes to so-called human intelligence or humans, which refers to information collected by and from spies and sources within hostile governments. 
governments. Pfeiffer and foreign allies are likely already concerned about how a second Trump administration will handle intelligence given the president-elect's record. He also predicted that Gabbard's confirmation as DNI would cause even more problems among skittish partners. Quote, I think they wouldn't feel like they've got an American confidant that they can deal with on a mature level, he said. I can guarantee you that the foreign intelligence services of Europe, including the Brits, are all having a little side conversations right now about what is going on in uh, what this is going to mean and how we're going to operate and what we are going to do now. The former US intelligence veteran also said Gabbard's record of spreading foreign talking points calls into question whether she will be able to carry out the DNI's important responsibility of briefing the president on threats to the nation. He told the Independent, quote, somebody like Tulsi Gabbard, you look at her long history of statements that seem to come out of the Kremlin's notebook, her propensity to be influenced by their viewpoint, it raises questions as to whether she has the ability to present the intel community's perspective as it is, or is she going to be one who's going to want to discount it, influence it, colour it and change it or ignore it and just present her own view? I think it also raises questions of judgment. You know, here's an individual who seems very prone to misinformation, prone to conspiracy theory. That should worry anybody who's worried about America's national security. You can count me on that, matey. Trump's selection of the former Hawaii congressman, woman, sorry, Tulsi Gabbard, could be a problem for the senators tasked with confirming her on several different levels. For one, the position is unique among cabinet agencies in that there are strict requirements for who can serve in the director's role. The text of the 20, 2004 law, which established the officer for the director of national intelligence in the wake of the 9-11 terror attacks on New York and Washington and the intelligence community's failures leading up to the US invasion of Iraq, specifically states that any person who serves in the DNI job, quote, shall have extensive national security expertise. So the question is, does Tulsi Gabbard have that prerequisite? Well, the article continues and I think ends. The first person to serve as DNI, John Negroponte, was a widely respected foreign service veteran who had served as a US ambassador to Iraq, Mexico, Honduras and the Philippines as a country's ambassador to the United Nations and as a deputy national security advisor during the Reagan administration. The three next people to hold office were flag rank military officers with significant intelligence experience. Pfeiffer, a U.S. intelligence veteran of three decades, standing once, uh, who, sorry, standing who once ran the White House Situation Room and served as chief of staff to then CIA Director General Michael Hayden, told the Independent that Gabbard's experience in the House and her military service, while admirable, do not match the standards envisioned by the authors of the 2004 law, which established the office. "Quote: That's national security experience." But she was a freaking military cop operating at a largely tactical level, not the strategic. So remember, tactical is like when in military, you're fighting over a hill. How do we take that hill? Operational is like, how does that fight over there, over that town and that town over there and that ridge over there affect how our entire region is, you know, how it's going there. That's your operational level. Strategic level is like, let's look at the whole war, how we how we doing the whole war. So she's the one fighting in her military experience on the hill. That's her experience. She's got no experience of strategic, which is overseeing everything and going, hmm, okay, blah, blah, blah. So operating at a largely tactical level, not that strategic long-term national security perspective that one would expect, he said. Gabbard may have left the Syrian conflict behind, but Mustafa, that's a girl who, at the beginning of the article, is referenced, uh, still works with its victims every day and he believes, uh, sorry, not girl, uh, Mustafa worked with girls who had these burns who introduced uh, were introduced to her and she questioned whether it was actually uh, Russia and Assad that did the bombing and wasn't actually ISIS. In other words, she wanted to get them, uh, Russia and Assad, off the hook. Anyway, that's the beginning of the article. Uh, what, happened in, quote, what happened in Syria is what allowed the Russians to feel that they could do the very same in Ukraine, he said. And what is she, what she is doing with Ukraine shows that it goes beyond her maybe understanding one conflict. She is, hook, line and sinker, a Russian puppet. Then we're just going to dip from a much shorter section of, the, of an economist piece 
uh, Shashank Joshi's piece in The Economist. That Edward Hunter Christie says is a very good piece about the threat Tulsi Gabbard poses to the US intelligence community. If anything, I think the tone should have been sharper still, but the key risks are spelled out. Experienced intel officers walking out, allies reducing intel sharing with America, among others. So it looks at the effect of her joining as DNI. So Donald Trump and Tulsi Gabbard are coming for the spooks. The president-elect's intelligence pick suggests a radical agenda. We are going to just join it at the at the end last three paragraphs but well worth reading the economist spoke to a dozen former and serving intelligence officials from american and european allies to ask them how they thought all this churn might affect american and allied agencies some urged calm one american official said that he had briefed ms gabbard on the house armed services committee and said she was less radical in private than in public okay let's just deal with that so one guy says actually what she says in public is a bit more mental than what she says in private I would be deeply worried if someone is willing to go in public to say mental things that are incorrect and conspiratorial, conspiracy theory thinking for what? For the gain of wing nuts out there in the public information spaces. I, uh, to me, that's almost more dangerous. Like if you genuinely believe that, then actually we can work on that. And, and you, here's where you're going wrong. And here, here are your miscalculations. And actually, we can bring you across to to the the light side, if you like. But if you're someone that knows that's false and is peddling those claims for political gain, then you're even more freaking dangerous. So this idea that, hey, we shouldn't worry so much because actually she's a little bit more refined in, in private. I would take that the other way. But. Other people think differently. So the DNI, in any case, is the most senior figure in American intelligence, but not always or even usually the most powerful. She oversees intelligence assessments and manages budgets, but does not directly run the agencies. So that is an important point. But our inte European intelligence official pointed out that intelligence sharing between his country and America actually improved during Mr. Trump's first term. Within the Five Eyes intelligence pact made up of America, Australia, Britain, Canada and New Zealand, signals intelligence gathering is so tightly integrated that it would be impossible to unravel without causing massive disruption to America itself. Quote, the Five Eyes sharing always holds, soothed the American official. So that's that one guy, right? Others are less sanguine. Many mid-ranking intelligence officers are likely to leave, says one insider, fearful of failing, of falling foul of political loyalty tests. Mr. Trump's lax approach to security is another concern. In his first term, he divulged secret intelligence to Russian officials himself, that's Trump doing that himself, allowed unvetted foreigners to roam free at Mar-a-Lago, his club in Florida, and infamously carted off boxes of highly classified material when he left the presidency. More recently, his aides have proposed eliminating FBI background checks and granting immediate security clearances to staff, even if they fail private sector vetting. Wow. And finally, Ms. Gabbard's Russophile tendencies, so her pro-Russian claims, are particularly jarring. Democrats, she complained in her book, don't want a peaceful relationship with Russia at all. This is Tulsi Gabbard speaking. How would their friends in the military industrial complex make trillions of dollars from the fear they fomented in America and Europe by stoking the fires of the new Cold War? Some in the intelligence world believe that European agencies might start holding back human intelligence reports or sanitizing them of information that would previously have been shared. For her part, Ms. Gabbard is clear about the ongoing threats she sees emanating from the intelligence agencies, which, she warns, are so dangerous that even our elected officials are afraid to cross them. The spies are on notice. It's looking very dodgy and it's a threat. It's, it's a... Um, it's a risk I don't think that's that's worth taking. Uh, I don't think you can think, oh, she'll be right. Maybe she's a little bit better behind closed doors or, uh, you know, she's just deeply inexperienced and ill-suited to the job, uh, notwithstanding the fact she's got mental geopolitical views. Now, uh, take it from someone who should know, this is H.R. McMaster, the former National Security Advisor to Trump. Blaming ourselves for the acts of our, our, our adversaries as... As, uh, as as Tulsi Gabbard has done, you know, talking about you know, as Joe Rogan has done, how, how Putin really felt aggrieved, and that's why he he had to invade Ukraine. Right, that that's a rushing talking point that she's repeated, yep. uh, and in direct contravention to what U.S. intelligence has concluded. Um, I also want to ask you about someone you. And this is what I, this is what I can't understand, Margaret. Yeah, there's so, there's some people in the Republican Party these days 
who kind of tend to parrot Vladimir Putin's talking points. I don't know if it's because they're drawn to him and see him as a kind of a defender of Western civilization, as the shirtless guy on horseback, but they've got to disabuse themselves uh, of this strange affection for Vladimir Putin, you know, who, who, is, who is not going to stop uh, in his effort to restore Russia to national greatness at our expense. That's what he's obsessed with. He's obsessed with kind of reestablishing the Russian yeah. empire. And so he has asked, blaming... H.R. McMaster has there just expressed the most concisely brilliant view on this and on the, the modern Republican Party at the moment. Listen to H.R. McMaster, Republicans. Listen to Senator Rounds. These are two Republicans that are expressing the deep worry about, listen to McCall as well, that that there are people on on that Congress floor that are spouting Russian talking points that are being compromised by Russia. How how has that happened? Um, And there might be some hope. So there are some GOP lawmakers that are privately pushing back um in on the full trump house takeover so this is a piece from alternet but it's it's not widespread but it's it's likely going to come from the senate as i've said before not the um not the house of representatives that have these two-year tenure people who are much likely uh the in the in the trump mold ahead of the former florida congressman's withdrawals from that gates uh, amid facing tr- sex trafficking allegations quote gop senators push back privately but not publicly politico reports many were hesitant to vocally denounce his efforts knowing the threat of trump's wrath and a, poli- a potential primary challenge constantly shadowed them so what you've had unfortunately are threats from uh, elon musk saying that if you challenge these selections i will personally pay for uh, the a primary campaign against you so that you will be replaced next time next election round and you've had marjorie taylor green saying threatening to um release compromat on on people if they go against um these these decisions so yes it's a really unhealthy situation uh, when Politico asked Senator Judiciary Chair Chuck Grassley, who is, you know, he's about 109 years old, uh, whether, quote, there was a lesson for Trump to learn from Gates' withdrawal, the Republican leader replied Trump had, quote, has the constitutional right to nominate. We have the constitutional responsibility to confirm. We each handle our jobs separately. So there are there are these hopes that the Senate might hold, might um, vet these n- nominees to a much greater degree than uh, Trump might hope. Uh, Speaker Mike Johnson's leadership role... um, Sorry, news outlet notes that despite Gates' exit, quote, incoming Senate Majority Leader John Thune has a slew of problems over Trump's controversial cabinet nominees, including sexual assault allegations against Pete Hegseth, who Trump tapped to lead the Department of Defense, as the incoming president leans on Congress to let him circumvent the Senate's confirmation authority and make recess appointments. Um, so you might get a bit of pushback. I think that's a little bit overrated. I think there's a, every chance that a number of these are going to basically capitulate to Trump's demands. I, I think you might get people like Lisa Mikowski be um, interesting, but it won't take too many. If if the Democrats are going to be 100%, if they if they uniformly say take Tulsi Gabbard it depends you don't want to do this to everyone because it just becomes a nightmare but there are certain people that that shouldn't get through I think Tulsi Gabbard is one I think Pete Hegseth is another I actually think uh, RFK Jr is another I think those three like you've probably got enough Republicans if they are if they're a bit ballsy to put an end to those but uh, but from a Ukraine war point of view I think Tulsi Gabbard's got to be top of the list of worries. I actually think Pete Hegseth is also a worry for you. But then, you know, you're always thinking, well, if he doesn't choose Pete Hegseth, who, who does he choose after that? Would he go even further into those um, kind of pro-Russian sentiments? So we shall see. Anyway, let me know what you think. Really appreciate your support. It's been a long one, as they always are. Sorry about that. Uh, take care, guys, and I'll speak to you soon.